Well, um, good evening and welcome to this Ian Ramsey Centre Humane Philosophy Project Seminar at the Faculty of Theology and Religion, University of Oxford. We're very pleased to, pleased to welcome Sasha Horvat from the University of Zagreb in Croatia. Uh, and it's very opportune that he approached us to, to offer a, a talk at Oxford because we are starting a big new project in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, a three million dollar project, um, part of a, a, a large grant recently given to us by the John Templeton Foundation. And we're just in the process of the final negotiations of that grant now. So this is our inaugural talk for a five year project, three million dollars, 200 subgrants, but it will begin with Sasha this evening. And he's going to be talking on contemporary scientific explanations of religion, uh, problems and perspectives. So please welcome Sasha Horvat. So, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I will especially thank Professor Pinsett for organizing this event and for welcoming here into London. Don't worry, I'm used to rain. Also in Rijeka there is plenty of rain, so nothing to worry about. Um, so, 45 minutes, right? Thank you very much. Um, our today's topic will be divided in the following parts. So, in the first part of today's topic, we will, dis we will do the justification of our topic. Then we will just uh, quickly elaborate why do we believe that religion is so interesting for scientific research. Why are we interested in what science has to say about religion? And then in the second part, we are going to do some serious work, uh, especially concerning new scientific studies of religion and evolutionary cognitive science of religion and their data for now. And the third part, we will see what the future looks like for our dialogue between these areas and theology and philosophy. So let us then briefly begin with the first part. So, why religion as such is interesting for scientific research? Well, in the, if we look at the religion in past, present and future, we will see that religion is a common and well-maintained fact. So, if you look at some of the data for instance, in religion in the past, we know now that because of the material evidence that almost every society had some kind of religious rituals and religious behavior and from the beginning of human form, of human societies. In the present, in 2000, for instance, in 2015, Christians were 31% of Earth's 7.3 billion people, meaning also uh, another number for, from 6.9 billion people, 5.8 billion people are religious. And that is 84% of the global population that is religious. Also, for, for the projection, projection, projections in future, in 2060, uh, we will still have a, a, a large amount of people, a number of people that are religious. So Christians, some 32% of 9.6 billion people. So in this way, when we just look at the figures, we see that religion is not a phase in human evolution that at one point will be past, will be um, a thing of the past. And we see that religiosity as such is not a phenomenon that can be avoided if we want to understand what does it mean to be a human being. We can say that human beings are homo religiosus. So, in this way, religious behavior will stand, will stand with us for a long, long time. So this is a fact. This is the numbers. So this is why religion can be interesting for scientific adventures. So the scientific study of religion today has many faces and that is why we can see that the scientific study of religion encompasses a plural and rich panorama of different models and programs that compete with one another 
to offer satisfactory theories and explanations on the origins, developments and current dynamics of religious minds and behaviors. That is a quote from Luis Oviedo from Rome. So, the question of religion is well known to theology, to philosophy of religion, to history of, of religion, to sociology, to psychology and to anthropology. But in recent decades, we are also witnessing rising of our interest in religion from fields that are dominating scientific areas such as cognitive and neurosciences. So, before we venture into these scientific fields, I strongly believe that the first we need to understand that we are not in a neutral position when approaching these scientific fields. So, what do I mean? I mean that we are not in some kind of philosophical, theological place, that we are in some kind of object, objective place and then that we can approach natural sciences. Our thinking and our terminology that we use in philosophy and theology is, are framed by our own metaphysical and anthropological framework. Now, this is something important to notice since often the other sides are also not aware of this a priori position of their reason, of their thinking. So the question is, since we have disciplines as theology and philosophy of religion to deal with religion, why are we interested in the scientific exploration of religion? My own thinking as a philosopher and also of many of my scholars was shaped by ideas of the encyclical letter Fides et Ratio of St. John Paul II, where we can read how faith and reason are like two, two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. The other important idea I, I would like to stress here is that desire for truth is part of the human nature itself. And I think this is very important also for, our, for the talk. So scholars from different disciplines share this desire to truth. In this way, the more human beings know reality and the world, the more they know themselves and God. So, the hermeneutical position from which we are approaching therefore sees the scientific understanding of religion as a fruit of human desire to know the truth. Whether we like it or not, we are standing in a long history of relation between religion and science, of their mutual inspiration and cooperation. Therefore, the idea that religion and science can only be in conflict needs to be regarded as, as an ideological narrative and a myth. This attitude was also nicely elaborated by Alistair McGrath, your own here, in his new book, The Territories of Human Reason, from this year, if I... Um, Certain. So he says that the relations of science and theology offers a case study in both interdisciplinary and transdisciplinarity, which many now regard as a necessary response to the growing fragmentation of knowledge, the increasing disconnection between the academy and wider culture, and a wider concern to grasp a bigger picture of reality than one intellectual standpoint or academic discipline can offer. End of quote. Now, this idea that we need interdisciplinarity and also transdisciplinarity is, is something that is also very uh, familiar with us at, our, at my faculty. By the way, my faculty is uh, celebrating this year uh, 350 years anniversary. So we have many years in past, but we also do hope that we will have many years before us. So, th this idea is also happening and trying to be realized at my faculty. As a part of our institutional project, philosophical and theological considerations of scientific understanding of the human being and religiosity, we also initialized these uh, scientific conferences called Rijeka's Scientific Bridges. Rijeka is a city name where my theology department is. So the main idea was to connect with all different scholars for different subfields on one topic, to discuss just one topic. So we had people from medicine, biology, psychology, astrophysics, physics, art, technology, information, and so on. And the point is, 
what did we learn from these four conferences up till now? First of all, we learned that some of the lectures from other faculties were uncertain how free they can be when discussing theologians on issues of religion. Um, in direct or indirect way, the theme of religion was present and it showed that some of the scholars from natural sciences did not have a profound knowledge of religious issues, although they were talking about it. Because of this, there was a clear need for interdisciplinary cooperation with them. But from the other side, it was also interesting that our own students from theological faculty were regularly more interested and had more questions from scholars from natural sciences than for philosophers and theologians from our own faculty, which, which is, was a surprising, but it gave us an idea that we need to work then on this to offer them, them possibilities to listen for people from natural sciences. Also, what we realized is that there is a different anthropological and metaphysical framework of investigation in philosophy and theology from one side and in natural sciences from the other side. And that this is not often recognized by either sides when starting a dialogue. So concluding for the first part, we reminded briefly why investigation of the question of religion is challenging why interdisciplinarity is important and uh, why is it a complex phenomenon and that there is a hermeneutical issue between disciplines. Now we can move forward. Now we move to the second part of the lecture. So, we will now briefly introduce findings from in investigation of two areas, neuroscientific studies of religion and the evolutionary cognitive science of religion. The aim of this part of the lecture is to highlight not so much the answers, but the questions that spring from these investigations. So, when we talk to God, when we act driven by our faith, or when we have any kind of religion experience, to what extent does the brain shape and enable this experience? What is the role of the brain in relationship with God? By exploring the growth, development, and functioning of the nervous system, can neuroscience contribute to a better understanding of religion? Can it explain, even away, religious behavior in pure naturalistic sense? In the last couple of dec decades, a number of scientific projects have been devoted specifically to the neuroscientific study of religion, which are expected to provide answers not only to religion, but also regarding the existence of God. This field of modern scientific research has become the scene of conflict uh, between neuroscientists, philosophers, and theologians, often in public space. Now, in these discussions, we, we see many attempts to provide wider interpretation and impact of scientific conclusions. So, we, we, we see examples that go from micro-level neutral, uh, neural activity and then we have some kind of, we can call it, interpretational jump to macro-level of social behavior of humans, including religious so behavior. So, the story, but not the scientific story, but the story goes that with the help of understanding the structure and functioning of neural architecture, the question of religion and God will finally be overcome as unnecessary evolutionary byproducts developed by humans for their survival. So now I would, just, I would like just to briefly uh, provide an overview of contemporary developments and then see the problems and perspective of, of these projects. So before that, according to James Jones, there are two scientific claims about religion. First, all religious thoughts and experience is mediated through cognitive and neurological systems. Now, this means that, the, that religious experience can be explored by the same physio physiological and neurological methods as any other human phenomena. 
Jones calls it a necessary working premise in all cognitive sciences and neurosciences. So, if some aspect of human existence is to be studied scientifically, it must appear in brain scanning on or in laboratory experiments. The second position is that religious beliefs are determined by the same boundaries that determine all other domains of human understanding. So, this is, this is the framework. So, what does neuroscience look for in the brain regarding re religion? For psychologist Warren, Warren Brown, the answer to that question depends on two perspectives how one understands brain function and how one understands religion. Now, Brown is wondering if religion is a, a fundamental and unique form of brain function, or maybe religion is a human ability dependent on an interactive combination of many basic brain functions, or maybe religion is a form of human interrelationship and social activity. So, on the one hand, we have a popular view that religious experience is determined by dysfunctional brain activity involving the limbic system or the limbic marker hypothesis. The difference between religious and non-religious experience is that the first one is related to precognitive automatic brain response in the limbic system. On the other hand, there are scholars that hold that religious experience are cognitively structured phenomena where thoughts and beliefs play a major role. So we have in these projects and understanding religion, we have some kind of precognitive versus cognitive uh, perspective on religion. Now, it is very important here to stress that when describing the functionality of the brain, the main metaphor is the functioning and structure of the computer. So, therefore, the brain, seen as a computer, is made of, of modules and each module has a task. Neuroscientific terminology uses phrases such as brain algorithms, processing, storage and retrieval of information, and so on. So, from this framework, of the computer, the hypothesis of God mo module was born, which considered that there is a unique un neural structure in charge of the experience of the divine in human species. For instance, neuroscientist Michael Persinger claimed that the religious experiences were caused by short and localized electrical activity in the temporal lobe of the brain. He believes that the human race would not have the opportunity to experience God if our temporal lobe in the brain had evolved differently during evolution. So, religion is seen as a result of a malfunction of the brain. More specific, that seizures cause religious experiences. The fundament for such theories is that some persons suffering from epilepsy of the temporal lobe also have been observed as hyper-religious some of them. So, already in Hippocrates, he named epilepsy the holy disease. So, neuroscientist Rahman, Rahmanandran states that although epilepsies as temporal lobe storms last only for a few seconds, they can sometimes permanently change patient's personality. The famous example for this uh, theory is St. Paul. St. Paul when he went on the road to Damascus, is often cited as an example. And it is claimed that this is not an extraordinary religious experience. The events, as the voice from the sky falling to the earth, and later on his strong religiosity, is the result of abnorm abnormal epilepsy attack, not of religious experience. Now, this is only part of the story. There are other scholars from New York neuroscientists that understand religiosity not solely but by one module in the brain or by a malfunction of the brain but as a result of, of the connectivity of numerous brain centers, centers. So, for instance, neuroscientist Andrew Newberg, he's the first name of neurotheology, 
uh, neurotheology is a scientific discipline that seeks to integrate religious and spiritual concepts with neurological and neurophysiological investigations. For Newberg, religious experiences are related to neurological events, which are, are unusual, but not outside of the scope of normal brain functions. Therefore, he and the Aquili, sorry, he and the Aquili said that spiritual experiences, experiences is at its very foundation intimately intervened with human biology. Biology, in a way, forces a spiritual urge. End of quote. Now, of course, he is not alone. There are other neuroscientists that also try to understand religion as somehow a product of, of, of body and, and, and uh, let's say, soul or, or some other element, not just the brain. For example, Alexander and Andrew Figel Kurz, they believe that we are still searching for the answers to the fundamental empirical question. Is our brain hardwired to produce God or is our brain hardwired to perceive God? They propose an entire view in which the human being is seen as a psychosomatic entity consisting of multiple structures and dimensions of human existence, physical, biological, psychological, and spiritual. The authors stated, Fingal Kurz, that it has been proved that more than 40 different parts of the brain partic participate selectively in various religious activities and that no clear agreement has yet been reached on the neurophysiological foundations of these activities. Now, we are moving forward on this um, overview of the project. So now, further away from the only the brain perspective, some researchers, as philosopher Matthew Radcliffe, propose that religion can be viewed as, for instance, baseball. Now, what does this mean? The idea is that religion is a cultural and sociological concept. Now, if religion is primarily a matter of community, then we should investigate more general cognitive and psychosocial functions that are specific for interpersonal and social interactions. Now, when we are looking at religion and brain in this perspective, we are now already into the field of that is called social neuron science. Now here, the culture and social phenomena are connected or trying to be connected to the brain functions responsible for processing basic information. The pursuit is no longer directed toward the God module, but God is, some, is trying to be corre correla correlated with brain activity, and so we need to understand why this association exists. So, these were just a few examples of neuroscientific approaches to the phenomena of religious behavior. Now, there are some serious questions that we will briefly state. First question is very important and it was uh, being posed by Anna Runehov. And she asks, can neuroscience study all kinds of religious experience? In what way and with, with which technologies? And in, in what sense are these phenomena explained? Further on, can research avoid the social context in which the experience takes place? If we cannot bypass the social context, then the question becomes much more complicated to investigate. Also, Nina Azari makes a good point claiming that there is also a justifiable fear that certain subjects of inquiry under the impression of experiments will offer a religious interpretation of their experience that is not religious at all because they are now assuming that we are part of these experiments and so they start to think that their experiences are religious. Now, the situation is additionally burdened with the understanding of experience as such. Now, surveys prim primarily focus on short-lived experiences, but individual experiences can extend and they can affect a lifetime, especially religious experience. 
Now, in this issue, uh, especially philosophy can help a lot because uh, phenomenology deals with, uh, with personal experiences and, and it, has, it was shown that there are many projects where phenomenology or neurophenomenology is helping these kind of studies. Now, there are many important issues here, but I think we need to stress one that is fundamental for us, at least as, as philosophers and theologians. Theology, theologians. Do we as theologians and philosophers understand what is being explained by neuroscientific experiments? Can we elaborate and can we comment neuroscientific images? Or to put it more straightforward, what do we do with neuroscientific results? How do we incorporate their results, their findings in our Theolo theological and philosophical subjects. Can we have use of them or not? Hmm? So the second part of this issue is that we have, we have to have in mind that neuroscience is developing on the wings of technology. As we have better technological measuring devices, we have better images of our brains. G German philosopher Martin Heidegger claimed that technology reveals our nature in a certain way. So the essence of technology is to reveal the nature in a way. This means that technology offers us a different way of looking at the human being, enabling something that I have termed the neurotechnological turn. Now, neuroimages of these hidden lands in our skull do not speak their everyday language and there is no discussion, no layman discussion with them but only some kind of interpretation. Yet explanations and interpretations of neuroimages remain in the hands of neuroscientists, almost beyond the critical method of theological and philosophical reflection. Namely, how do you doubt something that has been proven using brain images, that has been proven as this one, for instance. This is, this is a picture of the brain and brain activity when uh, self is being actively put to test. This is a picture from Professor Nordhoff. He is a neuroscientist from Canada. We are now doing a, together a, um, an article on the self. So I'm doing my piece from philosophy. He's doing his piece from neuroscience. And how can we understand these kind of images? So we would like to, to have this data. So this is the self when uh, when triggering uh, cell photographs on, of oneself, this is the self when he is in some kind of room, this is the self and talking about himself. So how do we explain, explain this? How do, how do we try to understand this and make use of this kind of information in our everyday uh, lectures and theories? Also, these kind of images are now being regarded as the true as images of the true human nature. So, in a way, technological devices that enable these kind of images become, become the devices of truth, showing us the true essence of the human being. So, you, you remember Saint Augustine claiming that God is more inner and the innermost of myself, and he is the highest, higher and the uppermost of myself. But today it's very hard to speak in this way because today we have neural structures that are in ourselves, 86 billions of them. So the picture is changing. Human architecture is no more uh, imago day. Human architecture now is the neural structure. So this, these are the problems in neuroscience. Now, the second issue that we are going to deal with today is the evolutionary cognitive science of religion. So, this is a different scientific area. It is now becoming more and more popular. And the fact of strong and firm presence of religious forms enforced the rise of a crucial question for the theory of, of evolution. If the members of all non-human communities and societies, and even the most primitive forms, 
practice some form of, of religious behavior, which then implies some form of religious belief, what is the role of religion in the evolution of the human being? When and why did human beings begin to believe in something, in some supernatural agent? Now, in an evolutionary framework, according to Armin Goetz, religion is understood as a cultural system and a social institution that has an aim to govern and promote interpretations of the world and practices in relation to supernatural agents. Religious behavior is seen as a phenomenon that can be studied as any other behavior, and so it makes sense to study it within evolutionary framework. So that is why today we are seeing the uprising of the disciplines that are called the cognitive science of religion and the evolutionary cognitive science of religion. Because of these new disciplines and new projects that are being developed, Robin Dunbar will, will say that evolution has again found God. So, what are these disciplines doing? Uh, if we want to understand the cognitive science of religion and evolutionary cognitive science of religion, as in all cases when we want to understand some kind of new scientific disciplines, it is necessary just to briefly comprehend the methods and objects of investigation of these sciences. So, the first one, the cognitive science of religion, attempts to understand the reasons for initial acquisition recurrence and continued transmission of religious concepts and behaviors. So, Barrett and Burdett point out that the cognitive science of religion ask questions such as, why is religion so common? Or why some religious ideas and practices, practices outcompete others? But also, how deeply religion is embedded in human history and nature? In this way, the cognitive science of religion attempts to understand the reasons for initial acquisition, recurrence, and continued transmission. Now, the topics of this discipline are rituals, faith in God, spirits, life after death, divine reward and punishment, and so on. When cognitive science of religion is trying to comprehend why are we religious creatures, then usually, I'm again citing here Luis Oviedo, we are dealing with mechanisms, or they are dealing with mechanisms, such as, for instance, agency detection. Now, agency detection assumes how behind every event there must be an agent causing it. From this mechanism, Barrett coined the hyperactive agent detection device, or HAD. Now, HAD is a human cognitive system developed through evolutionary path that responds to any noise or movement or sound from the environment. Why? Because if something is making noise up there, it could be something that it is good for me to eat it, or it could be something that maybe wants to eat me. So it was a question of survival for me to react as soon as possible to any kind of noise in my environment. Meaning that I attribute an agent being behind this event. Okay? So there are also events in nature that I, I cannot explain. Storms, thunders and so on. So the idea is that as I developed strongly developed the idea that some agent is behind every event. For the events that I cannot explain, humans start to develop the supernatural agent as causing these events that I cannot explain. The second mechanism is theory of, theory of mind. Now, theory of mind is a theory that tries to explain that uh, somehow we understand what other people are thinking right now, you know, maybe sleeping, maybe be active, but we understand them why we, well, we understand ourselves, and so we can project what are they thinking, how are they behaving, how are they feeling, and in this way, if we can understand emotions and intentions of other people, therefore we can also understand emotions and attentions of supernatural agents. They may be angry, they may be like this, fury, 
or they will maybe be merciful and so on. And the third mechanism in cognitive science of religion is minimally, minimally counterintuitive events or beings. This is when faithful attribute to supernatural agents, enormous powers like immortality, omnipotence and similar. Now, this disposi disposition would bias our minds and we would be inclined to transmit them to other people. So, in bottom line, CSR wants to understand how cognitive system supports religious ideas or expressions in an attempt to deepen our understanding of religion. So they want to understand how these mechanisms of our pro cognitive processes are helping us to sustain and develop our religious ideas. Now, the other thing, the other part of these new disciplines that are rising uh, is the evolutionary cognitive science of religion. Now, they have an attention to provide arguments for hypotheses that most common religious behaviors or practices are, quoting, rooted firmly in our uniquely human evolutionary history, end of quote. So the final goal of this field is to explain the origin of human belief in supernatural agents. Now, in an attempt to provide, this is also a quote from Turner, now, in an attempt to provide a theory of possible evolutionary origins of religious beliefs, Michael Russo shows that there are two main roads in, the, in this scientific field. So, there is the biological and there is the cultural road. So, if you take the first road, the biological road, then you are trying to argument that people are religious mostly because of biological facts. This road has two ways. So the first way is that religion is a product of natural selection because it has adaptive values, virtues, meaning that religion is worth as something maintaining and cohering group and identity. The second road from biological perspective is that religion is biologically caused and yet something of a byproduct. On this part of the road, you will find the most experts in this field. So, their main idea is that religious concepts are parasitic, in a sense that they use specific human mental cap capacities, in the same sense as do activities as playing, drawing, and so on. So, as it, in this way, we can explain playing music or painting pictures for Pascal Boyer, we can also quote from him, explain religion by describing how these various capacity, capacities get recruited, how they contribute to these features of religion that we find in so many different cultures." End of quote. So, religion does not have the real biological value. This common main biological traits have the real value. Religion only borrows it and it exists on them, being enabled by them. The second road, after the biological road, the second road is the cultural road. So, the idea here is that religion is also is product of culture, but also biology being in the background. For instance, evolutionary biologist Kevin Lalland uses the concept of culture to understand the evolution of human being. Now, because of the culture, he says we are smarter, we are clever. And part of this culture that enables us to develop is religion. Laland asks himself, can the process of evolution by, by natural selection explain all phenomena of our reality? Can evolutionary biology, quoting him, describe the origin of prayer books and church chores, chores, as does the origin of species." End of quote. So, for him, human beings have a different kind of the evolutionary dynamic because of which our species is uniquely unique. So, to explain this phenomenon by evolutionary principles, Lalland turns to the evolution of culture 
that is a big part of the explanatory process. So, we can now understand and support claims that hold that if we want to know what determines the development of religion, then we need a wider approach. In evolutionary theories, this would mean that we need not only to include biological perspective, but also the economic system, the social organization, the natural environment of the group or society in question and their religion. They are all equally determinative for evolution of religious behavior. Because of this, for instance, for Wun and Grunowski, religion and its layers are not a random occur occurrence, or to put it in biological terminology as they do, the respective natural, social and economic environment exerts a selection pressure onto the concrete religion which in turn adapts itself to its respective environment. Now, having said this, the evolution of religion cannot be understood only looking through one type of glasses. We need a more complex and more layer approach if we want to have a better understanding of religion. The interdisciplinarity need is being recognized and now different kind of joint collaborations with different kinds of scholars are being taking place at these fields. So, what are the possible problems with all these theories of, of uh, cognitive science of religion? Now, there are many issues we could discuss. For instance, the concept of God and religion that are used in these explorations. Or, can understanding in evolutionary development of human religiosity of primitive cultures help us understand the contemporary religion? Or, can we even explain uh, the root of human religiosity. Yet, I would like to here highlight one theme that also I did with neurosciences. Namely, the important issue here is to see that according to most of these theories that recognize the role of religion in human evolution, religion must have had some selective advantage for those individuals, groups or societies that practice this. This is the answer to the question, why are we religious beings? Now, this is a theme that a colleague of mine, theologian Piotr Roszczak and I are trying to figure it out. Now, the problem is that all of these disciplines are trying to understand human relig religion as being something useful. So religion is always seen in a utility framework. Why was it good for individuals? Why was it good group for the group? Wh how religion helped the individual or groups to survive? So there is a problem here now. Of course, this is understandable because in, uh, if you are evolutionary biologist, you will also always uh, ask the question, what, what is the fitness, what is the benefit? Why are we paying such huge cost? Because religion is costly for a human being. So why are we being religious? What do we have as a benefit for us? So this is, this is, uh, there are different theories in these disciplines that are trying to to answer this in a different way. So I will just go briefly through it. It's already getting late. I understand that you are being here for a long day now. So why are we religious? Because God helped humans to understand what they cannot explain. Or religion helped humans to face death, anxiety, or just to face something unknown, to calm down, to, to, as if the humans will have, everything will be okay. So to calm down humans. Also, we developed religious behaviors because it was in favor of our re reproductive benefit or, for instance, sexual selection or enhancing chances to attract mates. Yeah? This is also seen as a benefit of being religious. Now, Rob Boyd and Peter Richardson, they, 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 they discuss what, why do some groups in our evolutionary history survived, the other groups did not. And they said that 
it's because of better institutions and norms. And part of these better institutions and norms are also religious doctrines. So for their own, Jesse Baring will say that humans are religious because of the importance of behavior inhibitions for our ancestors. So it was important that there is an almighty supernatural agent that will punish individuals if they do something wrong against the, against the society. Further on, you can also hear the moralizing God hypothesis. It, and they are trying to provide an answer or the causal relation between the origins of religion and of complex societies. So, in a way, they, they are claiming that the belief in morally concerned supernatural agents culturally evolved to help large societies maintain themselves. Religion was kind of a glue that helped society to stay strong. So, to have stronger social bonds, to survive, and this is what maybe, according to Baskin, led to development of proto-religious rituals that are, were then integrated with myth that people were telling with, to each other. So religion was a process, part of the process of social adaptive learning, and this enabled the cultural transformation. So the point is that the answer to why are we religious or why humans so convincingly retain the ca capacity for relationship with, with supernatural, the point is that there was always some kind of benefit. And this is the main problem for us for theologians and philosophers of theology and religion to, to grasp this and to accept this, that, that we always need to, to, to look to utilitarian reasons of us being religious. So, conclusion of the second part, and then we will move to the final conclusion. So, all scientific endeavors in above mentioned fields understand human being as a sum of evolved biological and physiological mechanism in a strong causal relationship with environment and culture. In this way, every process or mechanism in human body, mind or brain has some cost. And this cost needs to be explained with utilitarian and practical purpose, giving justification of its very existence. On the path of this reductive way of thinking about human being and his complexity, religion and religious behavior must also have some utilitarian purpose, explaining it becoming such an established part of our lives. And now we can move to the conclusion. I think I have five minutes more for conclusion. Great. So, neuroscientific investigations of religion and evolutionary cognitive science of, of religion provided many questions that further investigation will, will have to deal with. Yet, we hi highlighted that there is a problem for philosophers and theologians with understanding of the neuroimages and the concepts with which these sciences operate and develop their theories. Now, this is a serious issue since we as philosophers and the theologians, we seek the fundamental structures and causes of all reality. If we cannot truly understand what are we looking at when we are looking at neuroimages or what is gained by these measures or what is the meaning of certain concepts in cognitive science, then these uncertainties are preventing us to come closer to the truth. We cannot satisfy only to look at conclusions of studies of these disciplines and then to search for certain logical mistakes or jumps from physical to metaphysical level or to search for entities or concepts that, that are different from our own. Now, I'm not saying that the mutual understanding is not possible. I'm saying it is a tremendous task to fully engage these questions and develop true interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary dialogue. That will bring some new knowledge about human religiosity to light. So, at this moment, 
I can only recommend few future tasks that I hold to be necessary for future dialogue with the scientific understanding of religion and human being. So the first task is to acknowledge different hermeneutical positions of theologians, philosophers and scientists from these disciplines. So we operate with different terminology, with different working anthropological framework and from different metaphysical grounds. This does not mean that we should just say our disciplines are equal but different and then go on with studies each in our own field. This separation is not good for theology and philosophy. We need to remember that history teaches us that religion and science always fruitfully exchange ideas. So we cannot just separate and say we are equal but everybody will do their own business. Second task is to be aware that we still do not have a clear path on how to use certain insights from these disciplines in our own academic work. This should not be seen as a threatening situation, but as a, as a positive challenge. Third ta task is to recognize the important role of philosophy that could, could be a bridge between theology and natural sciences on many issues here that we mentioned. Fourth task is to accept that scholars need permanent education in insights, in these new insights, and that they should be deepen their insights in this, into these fields. Now, the fifth thing is to provide institu institutions such as this one, who, who will be dedicated to our education of new generation of theologians and philosophers who will be familiar with the issues that we brought up here. So concluding, new scientific theories about religion that try to explain it away as a product of human nature or as a biological advantage in a fight for survival or as a necessary step in social historical development of the hum human beings is not so, not so new. Peter Fisher reminds us that the basic ideas of these different theories can be traced back to Hume, Lessing, Comte or Durkheim. Nevertheless, the empirical evidence provided by these new disciplines gives fresh strength to reductive theories about religion and human beings. We should face this new kind of argumentation. Fides et Ratio taught us that God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth. So different disciplines maybe have different modes of truth, but all scholars share the same desire, and this desire is an indispensable cornerstone of every future dialogue about human beings and religion. So, thank you for your time in this late hour. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I found it really interesting, and um, I was inclined to agree with lots of things you said. I have had a couple of questions, but uh, I'll, I'll confine myself to, to one, which was just, you mentioned very interestingly that your students in philosophy and theology at the conference you've run for a few years were always more interested in hearing from natural scientists speaking about um, what I understand would have been an interdisciplinary topic. And I just wondered if you have any uh, theory or any insights into why that is. Well, thank you for your question, yeah. Well, I think because they are lacking to hear these kind of speeches, I think it would be a good thing to have more interdisciplinary courses, so you, to have seminars with different scholars even. Because you know, scholars from natural sciences, they have a different kind of approach, different methods, different style of teaching than we do. And we too need to acknowledge this. And I think that this is also very interesting for students, for them to hear from other scholars about topics as, I don't know, evolution or science or physics and su such things. Uh, they are familiar with the way we are uh, giving lectures they are familiar with our methods, they are familiar with our attitudes. But when they have the chance to face scholars from di different disciplines in their own faculty, then that is a tremendous gain for them. So I believe that's also one of the ways to develop this. 
uh, and this, this type of interdisciplinary and then maybe transdisciplinary dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. It's a very concrete one. Do you have any suggestion uh, seen authors um, that would um, so the question is the following and then the suggestion for authors. It seems as if sometimes there are many like of the branches that you've mentioned that ultimately would tend to drive religion away by exploring like this kind of, or, or by reducing religion to like what you were explaining. So it's a little bit natural, I don't know if it's all right or not, but to us to become defensive as theologians or philosophers and in that attitude of being defensive, maybe we lose part of the research that was worth paying more attention to. So I was wondering if you have any suggestion of any neuroscientist that doesn't want to drive religion away and it would be easier to engage with. Yeah, but uh, it's no problem to, 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 to name them. For instance, uh, uh, scholars that are dealing with neurotheology. So, but the, the, uh, the, the, the problem is um, what to do with this uh, new knowledge, hmm? how to incorporate it. Um, because we need to understand that these scholars from natural sciences, they, they work in their own framework, they cannot step outside of it. So uh, maybe their, their agenda is not to explain away religion, they just, they just want to investigate it and see what will they gain from it, from these investigations. But then the, uh, the problem arises usually with inter interpretators. So the people who take these scientific studies, interpretate them to the public. And so this is not science, this is an interpretation of science. And, and now the problem for us that are not uh, scholars in these disciplines that are so varied here that people get lost, you know. Uh, the problem for us is to engage into this battle of interpretation as such. Because when you have scientific studies, you have, I don't know, introduction, uh, then scholars say they will use this and this method on this and this and these subjects, and we will use uh, this, these parameters, and then in, in conclusion, then maybe as a theologian and a philosopher, you can maybe look at the conclusions and then make some kind of reference to it. But basically, then you are not doing what philosophers do. You're not going right to the core of the problem. You're just on the surface of the issue. So um, many of them do not want to make religion go away. Some of them do. And uh, it's part of their agenda. Now, when this happens, then uh, science is no more longer a science. Then science becomes a wor worldview, a scientism. Yeah? Then, then we are talking about a completely different thing. And now what we can do as theologians and philosophers is to sharpen the insight of our students to recognize when something is science and when something is scientism, when science becomes a worldview. And that is why I mentioned here Martin Heidegger that he is extremely useful into understanding how the technology and science works. He, he even makes a, a really provoc provocative statement that science does not think. Now, you cannot say that science does not think and <laughs> be at ease with it. But what he has in mind is to say the way that science does the, the revealing of nature with help of technology is it, it, it's, it's not the thinking that is appropriate to human being. Human beings can have profound, more profound insights about nature themselves than the science can offer. Yeah? So I believe that that's, that is our task, to, 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 to somehow sharpen this issue and then to engage more fully into the dialogue. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Horvat. Um, I'm a great believer in looking to newer science and uh, learning from what, the, what uh, the study of the brain can offer us. And I'm a great fan of... Uh, as people here will know, the master and his emissary, the divided brain and the making of the Western world, um, because th that expands, uh, that, that book tries to expand uh, our understanding of, of how cognition works and to remind us of things we've forgotten. I think the, the, the danger with some of these interpretations of religion is that they're very small, they, contr they contract rather than expand. 
and I'm a bit sad to think that survival is the only thing that matters. I mean, here we are sat at Oxford University. This university is dedicated to uselessness, I have to say. Uh, we, we do useful things as a byproduct, you know, invent penicillin and whatever, but, um, but that's just a byproduct. Um, the university itself is dedicated to all kinds of useless activities, and it's a glorious thing. Um, uh, the danger is if we, if we pander too much or don't, don't challenge th this, this view, um, we impoverish ourselves, and, um, and that's rather sad. And when it comes to evolutionary understandings of things, there's only one answer, survival. Um, uh, but the problem is then the constructing the stories that lead to survival, and often it's very hard to distinguish cause and effect. You mentioned about um, some people thinking about religion growing out of culture. But the history of this university shows almost the opposite. I mean, the culture grows out of religion. Uh, even our musical notation system, um, our art forms, you know, so, so, many, um, so many specific expressions of culture. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you sort out the ambiguity of what's the cause and what's the effect? Um, so I don't, I don't have, have a specific problem, a question, but um, I just, I hope you can challenge when you meet these people who are interpreting religion in a narrow way um, that there's a bigger world out there, and um, and we keep the exchanges going. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. But that's the problem, you know, how to have time to to investigate all, all these uh, disciplines if you want to engage dialogue with them. And uh, because if you are, I don't know, if you are a philosopher, as as I am, and you have your teaching classes, you have your material, your own as philosopher material, but yet you want to engage into dialogue with them, so you need to study them. And it's very hard because, first of all, the terminology is different, totally different from us. And then when, when you grasp some, when you have some insights of this terminology, then the big questions come to, to pop up. And now, and also there is the question, is the other side willing for the discussion and dialogue? And this is something that we need to work on. So, to, so we need to work to understand them better, and maybe we will have some ideas that they help, can help their investigations. Maybe in these 2,000 years, of, we, we can have some ideas about religion that can help them develop their concepts in their experiments. Um, I wanted to follow on a little bit from what Andrew had said, and uh, just point out that um, very often when um, an explanation of religion is given in terms of its usefulness, for example, uh, evolutionary usefulness, we tend to feel threatened that this somehow explains religion away. We've given a reason why it's there in utilitarian terms and therefore we need not look any further. But um, if religion is true, it would be somehow odd if it was a disadvantage <laughs> in dealing and interacting with the world. And in fact, it would be baffling uh, if, if we take into account that the world is also created by God. We might, you know, ponder on that, but it just, it just seems, seems, seems odd. It just seems weird that this should be an exhaustive explanation if, if religion is true. And equally for uh, neuro explanations of, of, of religion. Uh, I mean, if people people say that there's a strong correlation between uh, religious experience and you know uh, oxidization of some areas in the in the in the brain, um, people feel threatened. But uh, it would be truly baffling if there wasn't any correlation. That that would be that would be the baffling uh, thing. Uh, so we we in, in a way it's pretty. Uh, to, it, it's to be expected that there's going to be some correlation to be found, as with everything else, as with, as with thought. And so I just wanted to point to a parallel um, as far as religious experience is concerned and these attempts of reducing it either to an evolutionary benefit or uh, 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 a neurological uh, phenomenon that happens in the brain to aesthetic experience. I don't know if you've um, looked at the literature on this, but uh, at least Ramachandran, who you've quoted, also tried to reduce aesthetic experience to just brain phenomenon. Um, along, uh, uh, neuroaesthetics is probably just as a, a lively 
really a current in, in philosophy as neuro, neuro uh, uh, theology. Uh, and there's a little article by John, John Hyman, who's at Queen's College here, here at Oxford, who criticizes both Ramachandran and Zeki, uh, showing that uh, even though there might be benefits, evolutionary speaking, to uh, aesthetic appreciation, and even though uh, it is to be expected that there is going to be some neurological correlate, it is not the question that we're asking when we're asking what is aesthetic experience, uh, uh, just to point to these things. So there are clear ways out of this, uh, uh, as it were, uh, cage that some people feel that these answers uh, uh, amount to. So uh, uh, basically my question is whether you can see any parallels to this aesthetic perspective. Uh, if, if in aesthetics we can, we can kind of establish that uh, it's not the end of the story, then clearly in a much bigger thing, which is uh, 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 religious experience, possibly, possibly too. Yeah, yeah, of course, it would be unusual if, if religion were not uh, beneficial in some way. But, but um, the issue is that it is beneficial because of the survival, only because of that. Now, that, that, that's, that's the question. Now, can we understand religion in, in a wider uh, sense, as did, did the, the professor that you mentioned that criticized the, the idea that... Uh, Aesthetics are only uh, brain, uh, let's say, call it epiphenomena or something like that. So the idea to, uh, of course, we we should not be threatened by by the results. Of course not. The better we understand the body, uh, how it works, the better we understand ourselves. That's fides et ratio. The better we understand the world, the better we understand the God. For instance, if you take, I don't know, I was, I was pretty surprised when I read uh, Bernard Lonergan and he was discussing Christology, uh, consciousness of Jesus Christ, and he was quoting all the contemporary psychologists on what, what does it mean to, to have consciousness. Why? And that was very interesting for me. So he, he, he had knowledge of the most contemporary theories of that time in his lectures on Christology. So the better we understand ourselves, the better we, we will understand the world and God. So that in this way, we cannot be threatened to it. Also, when it comes to reducing uh, certain phenomena to brain states, I think that some philosophers have, have clearly showed that we are dealing with these jumps from micro le level to macro level ideas. So basically, on micro level, we have uh, chemistry, we have physics, uh, physics forces, and then on the level, couple of levels up, we can talk about neural structures and parts of the brain. And then from that level, we are trying to interpret something that is basically on the top of the hierarchy as some, as some social behaviors, as religion, art, and so on. So we are basically jumping over many levels and connecting them directly. So that, that was also be recognized as a logical mistake of some kind. So we cannot make such interpretational jumps. So in this way, um, just to directly make, as Professor Pinsel said, what is the causal, what is not. We cannot make causal relationship, we can only make correlations. So now it's much more appreciated that uh, these scholars are now speaking about correlations and not so much about causal relationships of, of parts of brain to certain phenomena. Now, I, I do hope that I touched the question you asked. <laughs> okay. all, all right, since I'm nearest to the microphone, I will uh, take the opportunity uh, of jumping in and closing up. Just before I ask you to thank our speaker again, uh, I'd like to remind those of you here that this is the first in a double bill uh, of speaks. One, two days in a row we have uh, to open the new project on science and religion, uh, uh, New Horizons in Central and Eastern Europe. And so we will be meeting again tomorrow. Um, however, for now, please join me in thanking again Professor Sasha Horvat. Thank you. Thank you.